The first item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 14614 in the name of Alistair Allen on the centenary of the Isle Air disaster. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. Some members um, have indicated they'll be using Gaelic and interpretation facilities are available. So you can listen by inserting your headphones into the socket on the right hand side towards the front of the console. If, that, if there's a problem, you can't hear the interpretation, try using the audio button and selecting channel one for English. And I call on Alistair Allen to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Of Gareli, is Imitoch Karn Hockey is Tuknarioch, Nike Jig, Skehez, Nike Jig, Skehez Jig, Nike Jig, and Nike Jig, Skrivju. Had Darn of Leonishan, the Koinjo Hulant, and the Versailles, who had Kriach in the hockey, Geformal, Achbashin, Shach Musen, as Jade, and the Gunnichen Fasavach and Santawin, Nike Jig, the Hock Jig. I guess Gator Gunyanish, Ha Nike Jigs and Nike Jig, a cat Karen Yonach, Mar Hemla or Shan Kriach Hocker. Ach Anlunua to Kuyu, Ha of Leonishan, a gen of Kiel and Sadoi Vruchel, a Kahain Hast. An the Lios, I guess, on the Herug, Hatanic Kaula Hockey Vorg, Kriach, Ach e the Hirt Lodge and Vlianud. I guess for Pui Vor, Eka Rutahachid, Idan Lashen, Pui is Balchen, I guess, Tulichen. As the Helenan or Sant Blionichen Mora, Gusan Law and Jew. On Ruta Hachid, Hachin as Shaharam, Marahami a Klachkug, the Fachkelschen, Nach the Ranimich me, on Ruta Hachid Hast, Stoha Gwil Rutakan, Frekeroch Munchen, Eskas Gelro Groich Kogost, Nach Durst Munchen and Yelan Moran Mien, Sant Tri Fichet Bliona Kuyu. Vian Ioleer, Nakuspid Roth Fionel, a Hockel on a Kor of Moril. On an Tyson B. A ha kerst gewelschen gehoine choganush, kiet bliona as a yoi. Agas hamitangel geridev, gewel tunye vo gachtuv den farlamage, aunanju, gushen a yonov. So sha a rut a hahed maha, skiel, na haya lea. Edoicha halin, like a jig, a hock jig, va his majesty's yacht, ayo lea, a fagal cool lochilsha, gehironicuch, va enum gallic other. And Yulade, a Harokalagis, ek a howl of real, Kimmer a Hanach to an enemshin, I guess van enem Ioleer e the Hlachgu. Van Ioleer Lumalan Hyolateran, va Huchis Mo, you a chain Rachis, Jay Shirvish Hockey, Lisha Howl of real, Lisha Navy, a tor as the Chulachin, Ikna Dunia, va it bores the Hyoleer, a crunyuch e the Hia, a Mikishin on a Storvug, but Ulla Dachasuch, Gumbug Nagilian, the chain the Rashk and Yelan. And the judge, 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 I guess high four and brown down with the hija. Hashna Kitchen Gro da heat skehit fichet dunya it bores. I guess Hashna Kitchen Gundavasi da heat a sound dunya. I guess Patna Chija Ludevan Rutan Wavs of Shaw Tahurst, Va Umatuch Chuluch id he hast, Jidach Davila it follow, a fail go feuchnoch, Maravat id be feuchnoch, or from Kehit Blionich and Fatter. Maraha u oran yos of all. Mohrech, Mohrech, Sahanik, Hyangartus, Gutur, Mendiedich, Grian, the mad of Sumur Garsh and Wagon Luz, Hai Fister Fuch Gachachig and Rontarm and Rish from Dul, it clotter Chirinari in a mahur and Sagrund. So Linus Jason, Va Munchel Yosh, a cat the Machid and Trai, I guess Lorak more than you could. Hara Unharp a mess Gach Tri is a Lorak. I guess Vator is in Glasgow and Brown, the Hyo Lear, Hain, a stray muse, Huran Kaul Real Sanasamach, Garotagiri, a Garota Reich, an Ayo Lear, or some scrap. I can touch a Haro, is a Tunisian be to Kinch of Kova at Dol, Kova Edogol at Borsh, the Hyo Lear, a Kahu, I guess Koela of a fail, Edavatashik, a Sajoy, and Sheila. 
Ba ik tort in het doen je het boord en schielen, die kost ook jeetje het mielen van stjorn of ik moest er ook aan trekken. Goed om in een schiel, nu er, want het een teugel is, roek ik aan je met jeder houl, ik is goed en mag ik doris een teugel, ik er al een tjulig jeetje het jessiger, ik is tjulig ik kom er aan heen. Als ik heel erg een jaar eerder aan mijn naam zijn, ik is haar maag gewild, mijn jaar, joos, ik is naar haar geneentje en is. Ga je eens, ik kan goed doen je aan een alpe, Mun and I alir, I guess Bahor. Hatashpanyan, I guess Tahartasan, is the Aun and Bliona, and on Castle Josh, I guess on a diff jiffer valchen. Honic Tor Gunia Kurum Kul, I guess Drama Mun and I alir, is an art ruler, I guess Kuchokna Jalavan or in Mairat Nikerish. Haminochus can be Tahartas Elegaur, Parsons of Parliament Hain and Varsch, Ekevis Yorur, the darkest dawn, the Hur is Vok. She typisch, wo was doch de Raum de Häusch nach Sympi, da hier zu hören, ja, gehaul. Ach, als von Elan, hat durch die Wiener, die doch Humor schwei. Je wog, a je het je hüppisch, je kielloch, und a glassoch, und a rischenfler. Stachelgenbüch in a brien mir ein koik miele tschuldig, und a glassoch, a kaul mach, et a nu la. Schön an Schorsche bui, a weg an Eierleer, et a Häusch nach an a Jos, a gist ne Herrug. Ik is kunnig, haan ik aan je leer, als jij kakker, en zo al een uur gaan eerst nog, is mielen is drie keer niet eerlijk, een gauw. En zo zeg ik bij ons, als jij naar je leer, wat daar is in je land een gauw en kutsch dag is. Ga je morgen naar Canada, Australië, naar Staten, ik is Nieuw-Zeeland, zo naar Vigeten. Oor en een beetje een kunnig ook, een gokje voor, en dat daar je haar karren abstract. A chanel rutsen be abstract me in an eye layer. Bishin a kaharach of kiet blee on a lishirvishin, on the starnavog, I guess fash get pierced in hulum, a doich a halling, I guess is land a blee on ure. Of get really, stache gewil kutches moonyachach, na hele kerst vi a kunyachach et rutikan ho braunach e kanaum sha an se blee on a. A chanel e kanaum se den blee on a hachade. Hanaun is an un of la tieg den hawi na hanik an kakuch moor ke kriach per a vil mishu a fudach. Agus ha kerst tus jai kiet bliona mu yedig hal ke vil a farlam a jacking agus an dui jacking ke chunyach o kuchach. We move now to the open debate. We are quite time for time, tight for time, sorry. So if everyone could stick to no more than four minutes. I call Morris Corey, followed by Angus MacDonald. Oh, sorry, you know. um, <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. Um, I thank Alistair Allen uh, today for bringing this timely motion to the Chamber. Uh, the Ireland disaster was an unequivocal tragedy indeed, and returning servicemen lost in the sight of their home. Commemorations are always sobering, and I, I'm aware of this also with recently commemorating the, the disaster of the Otranto and Tuscania on the north coast of Isla Arion this year as part of the World War I commemorations, which I was involved in. But the sinking of the Isla with, Isla with the death of at least 201 men so close to their own shores strikes an especially poignant chord. Over the course of the First World War, over 6,000 Lewismen joined the war effort, about 20,000 of the island's population, and over 1,000 of these servicemen died during the war, a high toll for such a small community. Every family had a father, brother, uncle, or son who had died, and for those who were fortunate enough to reach the end of the conflict, we can imagine their relief to be heading homeward. They could look to the new year, facing comforts and familiarities of the loved ones eagerly awaiting their arrival. And on the eve of New Year's Day 1919, Her Majesty's Yacht Isle Air, a Gaelic for Eagle, left Kaifel of Alakalsh, bound for the Stornoway Harbour uh, on the Isle of Lewis. The yacht was overloaded with Royal Navy men, mostly from rural Lewis, when life belts were few and far between. And by the small hours of the morning, and at one point only 20 yards from the harbour, in clear view of the lights of home, the Isle Air struck rocks off the beast of home. Families waiting by the shore for their loved ones could only watch in shock. And with heavy uniform being worn, weighing them down, swimming to safety proved too difficult for many. 
Many islanders grew up without the ability to swim, having been warned to stay away from the cliffs at an early age. One man, John F. McLeod, managed to reach shore pulling a line of rope, which helped to save over 40 lives. Another man clung to the mast of the Isle Air for hours until he could be rescued, and the 175 natives of the island were claimed by the sea. Some men were found with rings and letters in their pockets. Some men were never found. The impact of this catastrophic loss on the Western Isles was devastating. In essence, it seemed a whole generation of young men has gone. And in this island communities, the loss was stark. Families who believed their loved ones had escaped the threat of war were confronted with a disaster that they could not have imagined. And the mourning was redoubled, as the Scotsman newspaper wrote in the aftermath. Many have had sorrow heaped upon sorrow. So we see why the Isle Air disaster witnessed life's end for over 200 men. It, also, it was also sourced as a vast depth of grief for many more. And this cannot be underestimated. For men who had battled enemy fire, survived torpedoes and suffered the extremes of war, this was a bitter end in the view of their homes. For the islanders of Lewis, Harris and the surrounding isles, the inquiry into this disaster failed to find a solid conclusion as to how this was allowed to happen. And with the century of the Isle Air disaster approaching this new year, I recognize the commemorations created in honor of those lost. Islanders have long known of the moments of this disaster, and it is time that the wider Scotland has a greater understanding and appreciation of the extent of its impact. Indeed, marking this remembrance has led to an increased vocalization of the grief passing through the generations in the Western Isles. And these commemorations have been a fitting and collective act of remembrance. While the War Memorial on Lewis was officially opened in 1924 and a monument not placed at the Beast of Home until 1958, I am pleased to see the tributes of today. For example, portraits of 100 sailors who died in the Isle Air have been created by Margaret Ferguson, an award-winning artist whose own great uncle was among the death toll on that night. These portraits have brought the men to life and have touched home, of, uh, home of for many families. This exhibition will open on the 29th of December on Lewis. And last month, locals planted trees along the road that leads to the War Memorial. On this anniversary, the Prince of Wales and the First Minister will jointly mark the centenary with a visit. These acts of remembrance are incredibly important and they allow us to respectfully acknowledge the disaster and the heavy toll it has had on the island community. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I join my colleagues in commemorating the Isle Air disaster. It opened a new year for the islands that they could not have imagined and saw the death of those who thought they had escaped its hold. As one of the UK's worst maritime disasters, it is a significant loss of life that we need to be conscious of and I commend us all to remember it today. Thank you. Angus MacDonald, followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, can I thank Alistair Allen for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. I'm, I'm sure that each and every resident of Lewis and Harris appreciates such a tra traumatic event receiving the recognition of the Chamber debate uh, just two weeks away from the centenary. Uh, President Officer, as a Lyosach or Lewisman, this is probably the most difficult speech I've ever had to write or indeed deliver in this Chamber. Uh, born and bred not just on Lewis, but on the farm where the tragedy happened, uh, the Isle Air disaster has been deeply ingrained in me since I could be aware of it as a toddler. Uh, the, the beasts of Hollam, where the Isle Air ran aground, are technically just a few yards off the cliffs and rocks at Stonyfield Farm. Now, at the time of the tragedy, my great-grandfather hadn't yet taken over Stonyfield. Uh, the farmer at the time was Anderson Young, who opened the Stonyfield farmhouse doors to many of the 79 survivors who made it ashore on that horrendous night, giving shelter and warmth to them. However, it was soon after the tragedy that Anderson Young moved with his family to Canada, presumably in large part due to the trauma the tragedy had caused to him, his wife and children. So my great-grandfather took on the tenancy of Stonyfield uh, just a few months after the tragedy, and my grandfather was to take on the tenancy of neighbouring Hollam Farm a few years later. Now, at the time of the tragedy, my grandfather and my three great-uncles were in their late teens and early 20s, living in the village of Sandwick, just next to the farms and they would have been involved in the retrieving of the bodies from the shores of Sandwich Beach and around the farm shoreline on that fateful day. I don't know for sure, presiding officer, eh, if that was the case because they never talked about it. Eh, and that has been the case on the island since the tragedy. Nobody or very few people spoke of the disaster. Even when I was growing up in the 60s, some 40 or 50 years after the disaster, it was still not discussed. So I think the many events that are uh, taking place, the commemorations that are taking place on the island are acting in a kind of cathartic way, allowing people to come to terms at long last with the grief and hurt that still exists and is still tangible on the island to this day. 
It took just over 40 years for an official memorial to be erected at the site. My grandfather donated the land for the memorial, and I'm pleased to see it has been renovated for the centenary. And of course, the path down to the memorial from the former Coast Guard Station Road End has been greatly improved in advance of the comm commemorations. Now, uh, born and brought up at Stonyfield and Holland Farms, I've experienced the impact of storm force gales there. On the night of the tragedy, the ship ran aground during what was up to a force 10 gale, possibly stronger. Now, I've walked around the headland at Holland Point in force 10 gales and stronger uh, a number of times, and one time losing my footing and nearly slipping into the rough sea. And I've seen walls of water lifting up from Stornoway Bay and crashing into Stonyfield Farmhouse. So it's actually beyond my comprehension what those poor souls endured, and it is beyond my understanding how there were th even 79 survivors on such a horrendously stormy night. Presiding officer, as the award-winning blogger Katie Lang puts it in her excellent Hebrides writer blog, the Eilier is in our DNA. Uh, presiding officer, I found it difficult to, to put in words my feelings, so um, if it's all right, I'll quote from the current minister of St. Columbus Church in Stornoway, the Reverend William Heenan, who said at the opening of the exhibition at Sandwick Hall, as we approach the 100-year anniversary of the Eilier disaster, the memories of the inconsolable loss of life still evokes deep emotions in our island population. Emotions that have been inherited from previous generations who lived through that fateful Hogmanay night and who had personally experienced the darkest dawn of New Year's Day 1919. The cloud of silence which then enveloped this island and our people and which has pervaded this community in every generation since is only now beginning to lift. These last four, year, four years of rolling commemorations for the First World War and the various major battles fought during it have in some respect helped to prepare us for this, the hardest and final of these commemorations, the loss of the Eilia. However, the silent grief borne by the people of Lewis and Harris, the excruciating pain of the sorrow which has permeated every fibre in the warp and weft of the fabric of this society, and the lack of both information and answers as to why and how the disaster occurred have to a large extent inhibited, inhibited the island from processing and working through their loss and coming to terms with their heartache. Time has helped to heal some of the wounds inflicted by the events of that terrible night, enabling people to at last begin to speak about it and to process its harrowing legacy. But the scars of the tragedy still remain. They are indelibly ingrained on the psyche of islanders and their diaspora, just as the peat banks and lazy beds now no longer work still mark and scar the landscape of our island topography. Thank you. Rhoda Grant, followed by John Finney. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank Alistair Allen for securing this debate? In a year that marked the centenary of the end of World War I, we're fast approaching the last commemoration, the sinking of the ILA. The islands had provided many men to fight in the services for the World War and had already suffered great losses. You can only imagine the relief of families hearing that their loved ones were on their way home, believing them to be safe and making preparations to welcome them. There must have been an air of excitement or maybe just relief. For the men themselves, arriving at Kayo must have been like a homecoming of its own. Those who had previously been fishermen would have been in familiar surroundings as they would have often birthed and landed their catch in Kyle. They knew the crossing well, so close to home, possibly for the first time in years. And they would have also been meeting old friends, catching up on news. Home was within touching distance. As more men arrived, the Sheila, the boat that was taking them, was already close to capacity and the Isle Air was sent to fetch them home. The Isle Air was not equipped with sufficient safety equipment for the number of men that were likely to sail. However, it was hogmanay, it would have been cold, too cold for people to be outside for the night, and it was likely that there would have been, there would have been insufficient accommodation in Kyle for all of them. It appears there were some discussions about this, but the more, with more and more men arriving in Kyle, the decision was taken to sail with devastating consequences. As Angus MacDonald said, many believe the tragedy was the cause of mass migration from the islands in the 1920s, and it certainly contributed to poverty, and the island's economy has yet to recover properly from that. 
As we approach the centenary of the loss of the Isle Lair, I was surprised to hear, as we've been hearing today from Alistair Allen, that many islanders say that they had only re recently become aware of it. It was never spoken about in their homes and villages, so deep was the loss. When I was very young, I first heard about the sinking of the Isle Lair, so young that it feels like it was something I've known about all my life. My grandfather fought in both world wars, as did his father. And my grandfather never spoke to me about his wartime experiences. We knew of it because of his medals and because he had an old demob union flag that he flew every time there was a wedding in the village. However, he did speak about the Isle Lair. He told us of the tragedy and the loss experienced by the whole island. These communities have come together and will continue to come together over the following weeks to mark the centenary and we must stand together and do this with them. I hope that the site where the Isle Lair sunk is recognised as a war grave, although I understand there is very little left of the boat. However, the beasts of Holland will mark the spot where these men fell. Chris Murray, whose work with the Coast Guard is recognised by the Queen's Gallantry Medal, has offered to dive to lay a wreath on the site on New Year's Day. And this will be another fitting tribute to those who were lost so close to home 100 years ago. As people begin to speak about the tragedy more widely, we see how these events impacted on so many lives. My Gaelic tutor told me that his grandfather had been on the Isle Lair and had for some reason transferred to the Sheila, a decision that saved his life. I also found out only recently that John MacLeod, who bravely swam ashore with a rope and saved so many lives, was the great grand uncle of Chris Bryant, the MP. And so the personal stories come to life. We must preserve these stories and remember those who were lost. John Finney, followed by Gillian Martin. Morning, uh, thank you, President Officer. Gavish Molishkal, Anya Lach, Bacon Galakakam, and Maris Havish Femini Bjorla Vrien. We do all refer Faraki a Havi refer Velaki. Now, I'd like to thank Alistair Allen for bringing this debate here and um, what little Gaelic I have, I hope, um, uh, was sufficient to convey that uh, the, a Gaelic proverb that said, there is hope of the man at sea, but none of the man in the churchyard. And I think hope's what uh, underpins uh, a, a, a lot of people's uh, thoughts around the, the, this time. And uh, um, men who had escaped the ravages of war, um, loved ones who are waiting for them to return unscathed. The likelihood is, of course, they wouldn't return unscathed. They would have been damaged by a, a, a brutal war. But so long as they were at sea, that hope remained, and it remained for, intact for both these people. And I wonder how we show respect. Well, we show respect to uh, the, the loss of the, the, the 174 men from Lewis and the 7th of Harris by speaking today like this and show that we value uh, the 205 men who died. The First war, World War was driven by people who didn't value lives. They had a contempt for life, many of these peoples. And that the sailors survived a war only to die hours from their shore, I think, is a, a terrible tragedy. And as has been said, with families waiting for them, some on the quayside and uh, bunting out, as I understand, and uh, the impact that others have t uh, mentioned, uh, that Lewis and Harris lost a fifth of its, its population in the war. 6,000-plus um, men had uh, served their country, uh, and... Uh, that had a significant impact on the Gaeltach in Scotland and, as we've heard, on the, the whole communities. And I, I think there, there is a collective mourning, almost a, a collective denial, and we would understand the significant impact that's had in generations. The lack of value, of course, was reflected by the fact that they perished in an overloaded boat um, with uh, in, insufficient uh, life boats and, and life jackets. Um, the, I'll not go into detail of, of, of the tragedy. People know how dangerous anyone who's travelled over the Minch in January will know how dangerous the waters can be. Um, and uh, the, of course, others have alluded to the very brave, uh, um, humane acts that took place and the great efforts that went in to save people. This was the, the worst UK maritime disaster since, two th since 1904 and uh, the worst peacetime disaster of a British ship since the Titanic uh, and uh, the largest loss of life in UK water since 1904. Someone else, I think it was Morris Corrie, referred to the, the, the Scotsman and, and the, their coverage saying many have had a sorrow, heaped upon a sorrow, and that is the, the terrible reality. Efforts to address that, there was a public inquiry held in Stornoway on the 10th of February 1919. The local community provided uh, seven men for the jury. 
the jury reached their verdict that the Navy were responsible. There was a naval inquiry. It was held in private, and it was held on the 8th of January. And as has been said, the Admiralty put the wreck up for sale, <coughs> excuse me, just 15 days after the disaster. Um, now, the Royal Navy ruled that in non-survival of any of the officers on the board, the ILAR, um, a quote, they said, no opinion can be given as to whether blame is attributable to anyone in the matter. And again, that's indicative of the fact that survival of the ordinary ratings clearly wasn't uh, uh, valued. Now, there was the ILAR inquiry, as I said, and I understand it gathered dust in the Admiralty vaults for over 50 years. The findings were not released into the public domain until 1970, and I think that's a disgrace. The Admiralty were insensitive in putting the, the, the vessel up for sale um, 15 days after the disaster when there were 80 bodies unaccompanied. Um, that was an action that appalled the community. Skipping a, 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 a group, I think, um, guys from Tyree who will be Gaelic speakers, they have a song just now. New Year of Peace would dawn tomorrow, sing to me the island ocean, from hope and joy to wrenching sorrow, far to the west and worlds away from the futile fields of war. I think we can best commemorate these people by not allowing a repetition of war. Thank you very much. Well done. Uh, can I give a reminder to members that we're very, very tight for time. Gillian Martin, followed by Edward Mount. Thank you, presiding officer. The sinking of the ILA and the loss of life uh, that night in 1919 has to be one of the cruelest events oh. in Scottish history. And I, I want to thank um, the, the constituency MSP for for Lewis and Harris uh, Alistair Allen for giving us the chance to reflect on it today and remember the men who survived the horrors of the First World War yet never made it home to their families. And like many people today, speaking in today's debate, I don't have any personal connections to Lewis or those affected by the ILF tragedy, but it has been very emotional listening to members who have particularly Angus MacDonald's powerful speech. I, I wanted to speak today because I remember hearing of the ILF when I was at school, I had a very good O grade history teacher, and I remember him going into a lot of detail about the impact that the, the war had on those at home in Scotland. Um, not part particularly of the curriculum, but he, he, he added that kind of extra to it. Um, um, and I guess he maybe, as fairly cushioned 15 year olds in the 1980s, we, he wanted us to try and grasp in some small way um, the devastating legacy that war has had and on Scottish society. The Isle Air disaster was one of the events that he told us about as he tried to bring home the myriad of ways in which the war hollowed out a generation. And his telling of it really made an impression of me, on me. This terrible event is said to have had uh, set in chain an exodus of young people from the island in years to come, particularly young women who'd lost their loves. One of the most heartbreaking accounts I uh, read said engagement ring was found in the pocket of one young man who drowned. And similarly, accounts of toys washed up on the beach bought, bought by young fathers as they look forward to seeing their kids after so much time apart is heartbreakingly difficult to read even 100 years on. The young women of, of Lewis now lived in a community where the male population of the island was decimated. Future hopes for marriages, future hopes for raising a family were lost to a generation of Lewis women. Future thoughts of raising a new generation of Lewis children were lost to many families. Uh, many families were obviously lost, robbed of their sons, husbands, brothers and fa uh, fathers in communities that already had lost over a thousand young men in battle. And in reading more this week, I was struck by this comment from local Lewis historian Roddy Murray, who said, we can speculate on its contribution to the mass emigrations of the 20s, its effect on the Lewis character, the rebirth of an inherent fatalism. Its effect was like the Passover of the Old Testament. It's fair to say that the war and the loss of young men possibly did put in chain a mass emigration to the likes of Canada, New Zealand, the United States and Australia um, as people tried to leave the tragedy behind. And we read accounts of those left, left behind in Lewis where the shock of the disaster left many unable to ever speak of what happened, to ever vocalise the unfairness of the hand that the island had been dealt. And of course, the, as many others have mentioned, the ILA was second only to the sinking of the Titanic in terms of life lost through an accident at sea in peacetime. Yet there are no Hollywood film epics, no minute-by-minute -minute drama documentaries on repeat on the History Channel. Perhaps the reason for that is that the grief was so concentrated in one community and therefore too painful to ever be dramatised or retold in anything other than a quiet and contemplative way, if at all. I, I guess I try, I try to have a sense of, of, of 
any kind of tragedy that I could relate to, and I guess in a similar way to the Piper Alpha disaster, which many of us find hard to speak of in our area. But as, as, as Alistair Allison has said, the loss of, of life at that scale in an island community is something that people like myself who don't live in an island community can't really get their head around. So this year we've talked often and quite rightly of the sacrifice made by so many in the First World War and the centenary of, of uh, the war's end. I want to again thank Alistair Allen for once again allowing us to pay our respects to the returning servicemen of Lewis, their families and the community who were so deeply scarred by the tragic accident that day. Edward Mountain, followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am conscious that we have heard a lot this afternoon from people who are very closely related to this incident. And I don't want to add very much more to say, but to thank Alistair Allen for bringing this debate to the Chamber. And it's right that we should be thinking about this event as we think about returning home at Christmas. The fact that it was 100 years ago, then there were 280 men, so sailors who were involved, trying to travel home as well for the new year makes it more poignant. I've been interested to hear about the overloaded boat and the fact that the Navy didn't respond as it should have done and the fact that those sailors were weighed down with kit. And the great hero heroism that we heard of John Finley MacLeod swimming ashore with his rope and rescuing the 40 men. And it's right that he's immortalised for his effort and the sculpture to be unveiled by Prince Charles in the new year. And I think it's right that we remember at Christmas a time when it should be a joyous time that we should be spending with our family that in 1919, in the new year, there were lots who didn't. People lost brothers, husbands, uncles, cousins. And I, it's, it, I struggle to understand and comprehend how difficult that would be because every family would be connected. So, presiding officer, I'm keeping my contribution short purely because I want to hear other people's contributions. But I do think it's right that we think about this disaster, the worst maritime disaster that we've had in Britain's history. And it's more tragic for the fact that these sailors had survived the Great War and were returning home. And I'd like to finish by commending all those who are organising the National Commemorative Services at New Year. I know a huge amount of energy has gone into these preparations. And I'm sure the events will be a fitting act of remembrance to this national disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mountain, for giving us some time back. Joan McAlpin, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start also by paying tribute to Alistair Allen for securing this debate? It's fitting that our Parliament gives time for reflection and commemoration almost a century after this disaster, which took 201 lives. And I say fitting because, as others have said for a long time, this tragedy was seldom mentioned in public discourse. It was so enormous in scale, it was almost an unspeakable thing. These young men survived the slaughter of World War I only to perish within sight of home. And their loss cast a dark and silent shadow over the islands which had lost so many more young men in the war. And others have talked about the significant demographic effect that that had, these men would have been coming home uh, to start families uh, with their sweethearts, as others have said. And as it was, depopulation accelerated rapidly in the 1920s in the Gaeltach. There is another Islier legacy. The years of silence have lifted and the tragedy is now properly explored and features extensively in the oral, social and cultural history of the Outer Hebrides. And I want to pay particular tribute to a dedicated web resource in Gaelic and English created by the National Records of Scotland, uh, which digitises a wealth of the original documents and uh, oral history um, uh, from the time, including facsimiles of news reports like this one in The Scotsman from the 6th of January 1919. It reads, carts and little processions of twos and threes, each bearing its coffin from the mortuary, pass through the streets of Stornoway on their way to some rural village and all heads are bared as they pass. The digital resource also draws on the work of the journalist John McLeod, whose highly praised book, When I Heard the Bell, documents the loss of, its, of the Islayer and its aftermath. And there are interviews with islanders of today's generation, such as 17-year-old Freya McLeod, the great-granddaughter of the Islayer survivor, John Finlay McLeod, who saved uh, upwards of 40 people uh, on the stricken ship by swimming ashore with a life rope. 
The resource also links to some of the many artistic responses uh, to the Isle Air disaster, uh, such as recordings made in the 1970s uh, by mus musicians and poets who were alive at the time of the sinking. And contemporary artists have also responded to the centenary uh, and Lantern is currently showing Dawn Till Dark, an exhibition featuring the work of glass artist Alec Galloway and photographer Vary Law. Uh, and although unfortunately I have been unable to see the exhibition, I have been impressed by some of the images that I've been able to view. Uh, my partner, who is a writer, assisted Mr Galloway with a piece called Harbour Full of Words. It's a beautiful large glass bowl filled with seawater from the harbour and lit beneath uh, and containing 201 pieces of sea glass collected from beaches where victims were found. Each piece of the glass is etched with a word connected to the Isle layer, including the names of all those who died. And the New Year sees another exhibition, Isle layer 100 by Margaret Ferguson, featuring portraits of the sailors who died, as well as those who survived. And I think that's fitting because although the tragedy of the Isle layer is all about loss, it's also about survival. A community which suffered so much loss, death, migration, did survive as Gallic culture continues to inspire people around the world. Lives were stolen that night, but hope was not extinguished. The Isle Air has become a symbol of sorrow, certainly, but also a symbol of resilience. Thank you. Lewis MacDonald, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much. I was a child in Stornoway in the 1960s, years after the Isle Air disaster. Many women of the Isle Air generation were still alive when I was a boy. <coughs> I saw them simply as Kalyachs, old women dressed in black. I did not know then how many had lost their husbands or fiancés on a single day so many years before and mourned them still. The Kalyachs dressed in black reflected the pain of the whole town of the whole island. Many young men had perished in the Great War. Many younger women and men were to leave for North America in the hungry 20s. In between came this terrible, gut-wrenching, soul-searing loss of so many who had survived the war and so nearly won home. 50 years later, the despair of that dark and stormy night still dominated the life of the island. Yet so painful was it that people in Lewis then hardly talked of it at all, as Alistair Allen and others have said. As Alistair Allen also said, the loss was not in Lewis alone. My grandfather, Donald John MacDonald, was of the same generation. When the Great War ended, he was 28 years old, a member of the Royal Naval Reserve, like most of those who drowned on the Isle Air, and he had served in the Mediterranean since 1915. He had grown up in the Isle of Bernerai of Harris, a little island of a few hundred souls. His own father had died at sea. His widowed mother had raised her children in a cottage by the quay. Home leave for Donald John involved a voyage to Stornoway from the mainland, then a 60-mile walk to Rodel or Ob in Harris, or a run home in a fishing boat from wherever he could find one going in the right direction. Mercifully, Donald John was not travelling home on leave that new year. He was not on board the Isle Air. He went on to sail the seven seas as a merchant seaman in the 1920s to marry Mary MacDonald from North US to raise a family of their own. But other young men from Bernary were not so lucky. Norman MacKillop was 19, Donald Patterson only 18 when they died on the Isle Air. Those were boys my grandfather knew, and the loss of even two such young men was a heavy blow for a small place like Burnley. It was a personal tragedy too for the families of those who crewed the Isle Air, who hailed from ports all around Britain. David MacDonald from Virginia Street by the harbour in Aberdeen, a signal boy aged 17, was the youngest to die that day. And school students at Aberdeen Grammar School, School have helped to remember him this year, adding a granite stone in his name to the new commemorative cairn in Stornoway. Because even in Lewis, a hundred years on, the shadow has retreated and a new generation of islanders are able to commemorate the Isle Air in a way that previous generations could not. Ian S. MacDonald wrote many fine songs. One of the finest is the Isle Air. Like me and my sister Deirdre, whom he married, Ian was a child in 1960 Stornoway, still in shadow and in silence. 
but to hear him sing his song of the Isle of Earth was almost to hear the storm itself so dark with rage and loss. That song is his memorial too, as he has died too young in this centenary year. To the families of Lewis, the chilly winds moaned, your sons, they have perished and will never come home. It seemed each pebble on the shore, it bore a sailor's name. Good year of communication, yet we will indeed remember them. In order to hear contributions from the last two speakers and the Cabinet Secretary, uh, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I would invite Alistair Allen to move a motion without notice. Move. Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That is agreed. And we have Kenneth Gibson followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank my colleague Alistair Allen for bringing forward this important debate. For those listening from out with the Western Isles, this might be the first time they've heard of the Isle of Tragedy, despite it being the worst peacetime British sea disaster since the Titanic, and despite its devastating impact on both the population and morale of those islands. Today we bring that tragic New Year's Day 100 years ago to the fore and highlight the moving remembrance taking place. Two months after the end of the Great War, leave was granted for many to return home, and on Hugmanay in 1918, Eilir set off from Kelvil Kalsh at 7.30 p.m. At 1 a.m., the Eilir was sailing far, far east for reasons we do not fully understand as yet. Uh, lights on the beast of home warned of danger, but the ship failed to turn. Uh, its momentum pushed her forward, and as a gale took hold, the Eilir failed to change course. Instead, she carried full steam ahead into the pitch black night, striking the beasts of home at 2 a.m. on New Year's morning. Over 200 men died, including 174 from Lewis and seven from Harris. 79 survived, 40 saved, as we've heard by the heroism of John Finlay MacLeod. The island's contribution to the Great War had been considerable with 6,172 men from Lewis serving on the armed forces, a source of pride for an island of just 29,603 souls in 1911. Yet losses had been heavy. From the 51 houses in the village of Lourbost alone, 32 men had been killed or badly wounded. 11 more would be lost on the Isle Air, which sank less than one mile from safe harbour. What is most upsetting about this disaster is that having survived the horrors of war, these young men should drown as their families gathered to welcome them home to communities that missed them sorely. A third of those lost in the Isle would never be recovered, but many bodies given up by the sea were washed up on Sandwich shore, a sight that haunted those who saw it for the rest of their lives. The tragedy impacted on islanders for decades, morale was shattered, and mass emigration followed. John MacLeod, author of a comprehensive account of the disaster, when I heard the bell, wrote that his grandfather was eight at the time and never forgot standing out his, outside his door in the village of Cross and seeing carts coming over the brae with coffins. Cats passing the house, cats with one coffin, cats with two coffins, cats with four coffins, coffins after coffins. Lewis actually ran out of coffins, which had to be brought from Kyle. That detail encapsulates the scale of the tragedy on such small, close-knit communities. A hundred years on, the disaster is now entirely out of human memory, and yet people are talking about the Islea. A new generation of islanders wants to understand the pain, the tragedy inflicted, to know the men they lost and the grief felt by those left behind. Perhaps with the last survivor and the last child who lost a father now gone, people are finally free to revisit this tragedy, giving it the commemoration due. One particularly moving contribution to the centennial remembrance is Katrina Black's animated film, You Are at the Bottom of My Mind, building from stories told in Gaelic from decades past by survivors and witnesses. Adding a traditional music score specially written for the creation and hand-drawing 25 frames for every second of the five-minute film. It becomes a moving painting of seven and a half thousand drawings, 10 months in the making, laid with photographs and films, such as the seaweed covered surface of the deadly beasts of home and the gravestones of men lost to the sea. Those poignant details bring the artwork to life and remind us of the brutal reality of what happened that night. I encourage everyone to watch the film when it is broadcast on Hugmanay. Presiding officer, today we've recounted stories of bravery, grief, and the sheer waste of human life. Now, a century later, we have a chance to remember and allow for the sharing of grief decades in the making. The last of the open debate contributions is from Joanne Lamont. 
Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I say I feel greatly privileged, if a little hesitant, to participate in this debate, remembering a tragedy, the cruelty and impact of which is almost beyond comprehension. I want to congratulate Alistair Allen for his beautiful speech. Um, Gaelic is sadly not a, a language I can speak, but it's the language of my soul, and I love to hear that language whenever I can. But to all of those who have spoken um, of their own direct relationship to this terrible tragedy, I am the child of island parents, albeit Tyree and not Lewis. My father was at sea all of his life, and from an early age, my mother made us aware of just what risks his jobs brought and the joy and relief it was for everyone at sea to reach safe haven. Islanders understood then and understand now the power of the elements to shape their lives, to shape their opportunities and their future. And as a young woman, I began visiting the Isle of Lewis. And can I say that it's an island of great warmth, generosity, humour and sense of community, even if it has, like many other places, a sad history. But it was only when I started visiting the island that I learned of this ta terrible tragedy, despite its immensity and despite my own great interest in the history of the islands and the highlands of Scotland. Those who suffered did so within their families and communities. And that part of our history has been left largely unreported. And it's why this debate and the events surrounding the centenary are so important. Sometimes we look at tragedy and see it's hard to imagine what it felt like or what its impact was. But it is when we do start to imagine, the horrors become overwhelming. Young men lost at sea, not just young men lost at sea, but returning safe at the end of a war where they must have suffered terribly and seen the brutality of war firsthand. Not just young men, but 201 souls returning to small communities where their loss wiped out a whole generation from within individual villages. Not just young men coming home, but coming home on the 1st of January to celebrate the new year, the only day of celebration in the whole year on the island in those days. And a day, new year, which signified the importance of family and community, of mutual support, a time for reflection on the past, but also a time to look at prospects for the future. And, you're not, um, and young men not lost on a foreign field, but as families gathered on Stornoway Harbour to meet them, lost within reach of safe haven, lost within sight of home. This tragedy is almost beyond words, and for many its consequences and impact went unspoken for generations. And it is important to remember, but also to understand the importance of renewal, to do what we can to support fragile, remote, rural communities, to maintain optimism for the future, where migration from parts of Lewis reflected the pessimism that followed the tragedy. Small changes on an, small um, occasions or events on a national scale can have a catastrophic effect on small communities. And in conclusion, I want to congratulate all those involved in marking the centenary for their sensitive, creative, thought-provoking and challenging events that they have produced. And I want to highlight just one example, uh, I think a moving example, a good symbol of all of this, and is the Shinty match that is being organised to be held in Lewis on the 1st of January between the Lewis Shinty, Shinty team and a team from, team from Kinloch Shield Shinty, Shinty Club coming from the Kyle of Lagarge, from which the returning sailors departed for the last part of their journey. I have a particular family pride and connection to this event, but it does seem to me to be a powerful symbol of what was lost. Young men, some of them Shinty players, lost their potential, denied their future, and these two young teams will play the game that was denied to them. In the renaissance of Shinty in recent years on the island, that remembrance should also be renewal. This new generation of young islanders offering their respect for the past and their determination to be part of securing the cultural, sporting and economic future of the island that they love. This is a time of immense sadness when immense sadness is remembered, but it's also a time to recognise the strength of the human spirit in the darkest of times as was seen in those communities and the strength of these communities in renewing themselves. It should be a time of hope for the future too.
I now call the Cabinet Secretary to respond to the debate uh, for around seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to also thank Dr Alistair Allen for proposing this motion and giving the Parliament the opportunity to record our recognition ahead of the commemoration of this terrible tragedy. The fact that so many MSPs wanted to speak in this debate is testimony to that, and each and every one of them were very fine speeches indeed. Uh, I was particularly touched by Angus MacDonald's um, very personal story and Lewis MacDonald's personal reflections, and they gave us an insight into the sense of that continuing grief, a grief so silent for so long. Only last month we marked the centenary of the first armistice of the 11th of November 1918 and reflected on the emotions which uh, would have been felt at the time, the joy that war was over, the grief for those who would never return, recognition the world would never be the same and the uncertainty for the future. And the people of the Western Isles would have felt all of this. Their losses had been amongst the heaviest in any community, with one in six of those who joined never returning. However, by Hogmanay in 1918, the armistice had been signed and some of the men from the Isles were on their way home. You can imagine those at home keeping an eye on the clock and mentally following the journey whilst preparing to welcome the homecomers. Poet Myrtle McFarlane in Last Night the Isle Air Was Wrecked so beautifully describes the joy of a young woman in Lewis as she bakes in preparation for her sweetheart's return. And let me share you the first verse, uh, first verse briefly in Gaelic with you. So we know who knew you a Kalin, a ruin and Lois, a funia unaran, le cria lansolish, a cunia ulenin, hatich in air fuller, kin chin gashik ich kirinch, fair and garari. And this is a scene that would be taking place across the islands, so how cruel for so many that the welcome was denied. And for those who did survive, how could they celebrate a return when so many had that celebration snatched away within the very sight of their homes? It is small wonder that it was too painful to discuss. But life had to go on and it did, and although for many that life would be far away, in Australia, in Canada, New Zealand, yet more loss for the islands. And the story of what happened to the Isle Air has never been widely known outside the islands. And for that reason, when I set up the Scottish World War I commemoration panel in 2013, and they set about the task of recommending which events would form the Scottish commemorative programme, there was a determination from the start to include the tragic loss of the Isle Air. From the beginning of the commemorative period, the Isle Air commemorations was established as Scotland's last act of remembrance in the official World War I commemoration programme. And it wouldn't be the armistice because Scotland still had the anniversary of the Isle Air to come. I quoted from a poem by Murdoch McFarlane earlier, and over the years, there have been a number of other poems and books highlighting the deep impacts this tragedy had on the tight-knit island community. And the land of the Gales has always been renowned for its poetry and song. However, as the centenary has drawn closer and the full story emerges, innovative arts organisations are telling that story of what happened in moving and engaging ways. As part of the Year of Young People, schools across the islands have been working on the GLIP project, which culminated in an evening of music and dance and drama and song dedicated to Isle Air at the Nicholson Institute in Stornoway last week. Uh, Art Centre Atlanta is delivering a range of events from talks to an exhibition of 100 portraits created over the past two years of sailors lost and saved in Isle Air and even, as we've heard, the animated film. 1418 Now, the UK's official arts programme for the centenary of World War I commissioned two new suites of Gaelic music. Kuhn uh, U Lura, Isle Air Elegy by uh, Lewis Bourne Piper and composer Ian Morrison, and Untress Su Lura, The Third Wave by Duncan Chisholm. Uh, and he's worked with Julie Fowlis to create a piece which pays homage to John Finley MacLeod, who, as we've heard, swam ashore with a rope to create literally a lifeline which saved 40 men. A truly remarkable story. And BBC Scotland and BBC Alba are producing a wide and varied range of programmes on television and radio around the centenary. The stunning new sculpture at the site of the memorial will be unveiled on the national commemorative event on the 1st of January. Situated within a few metres of the spot where the ship floundered, its simple design provides a fitting addition to the existing memorial and a moving spot at which to take a moment to contemplate the tragedy which unfolded on the rocks below. Uh, Prince Charles, who bears the ancient title of the Lord of the Isles, accompanied by the First Minister, will attend the service of commemoration on the 1st of January 2019. And they will also have the opportunity to speak with descendants of those lost and of those saved. Also happening on that date, 
uh, a Calmac ferry with around 500 local people on board will sail out on the spot where the Isle Air turned towards the rocks. A short service will be held on board before 201 school children each drop a single carnation overboard, one for each man who died. Resigning officer, there can be few stories more tragic than the, that of the Isle Air. The men on board would have been rousing themselves from sleep, closing books, pulling their belongings together, the things that we all do when we come to an end of a journey. Those waiting would be noting the time, possibly heading for the harbour if they lived in Stornoway. The end of that journey would have been and should have been a joyous occasion. So 100 years on, it is right that the last act of the remembrance in the Scottish Commemorative Programme is the Isle Air commemoration as the impact on the tight-knit island community was beyond measure. But as we've heard in this debate, this is a story and this is an impact which will continue with the people of those islands for a long time to come. Uh, we have had the privilege to pay honour and tribute uh, during this debate, but it's important and incumbent on us to make sure that their memory lives, that we do have that renewal that's been spoken about in the debate. So on the 1st of January 2019, I hope we'll all take a moment to reflect on the events 100 years ago which have left such a poignant legacy. More in time. Uh, that concludes the debate on the centenary of the Isle disaster. And this meeting is suspended until 2 o'clock.